hosted by Volunteer Match. My name is Shari Ilson. I'm the Senior Online Communications Manager at Volunteer Match, and I'm the host and producer of these webinars. The Nonprofit Insights webinar series is an opportunity for all of us to have discussions about big picture issues and trends in the areas of volunteer engagement and nonprofit technology. And today we are lucky to be joined by two wonderful people to talk to us about millennial engagement. Before we get started with that and I introduce our speakers, however, I want to go over a few logistics. So first of all, we will be providing links to full recording on YouTube as well as the slide deck for this session. So don't worry about getting access to those. You will have them. And don't worry about taking notes. Um, we want you to participate in the, this, in the discussion and listen in and not worry about getting all the information down. We will provide that for you. If you have questions or you'd like to say something to our speakers, you can uh, submit your question using the chat box at, at the bottom right of your screen. And you can also join the discussion and submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag VMLearn. Another hashtag that's useful for this session is cause for change. That cause the number four change. And um, I'll, uh, I'll write that in and send it to all of you in the chat box um, in just a moment. So um, uh, just a reminder, again, we'll be providing the recording and the slides. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. So today's session is called Why and How Nonprofits Can Engage Millennials for the Long Haul. And presenting today are Derek Feldman and Carrie Gunn-Saratovsky. Derek is the CEO of Achieve, a bipartisan nonprofit organization that helps states raise academic standards, improve assessments, and strengthen accountability to prepare all young people for post-secondary education and citizenship. So basically, lots of millennial work. Derek leads Achieve's creative team to design and develop fundraising campaigns for clients and will impact research team to understand how people in their 20s and 30s connect, involve, and give to causes. He is the co-author of the new book, Cause for Change, the why and how of nonprofit millennial engagement. So Derek knows a thing or two about millennials. Terry Saratoki is the founder and principal of KBS Strategies, a nonprofit consulting practice that's focused on organizational design, program execution, and millennial engagement. She is also the co-author of Cause for Change, the why and how of nonprofit millennial engagement. And if, if, um, if you haven't taken a look, I recommend that you do so. I read it, and it's fascinating. And as a nonprofit professional and a millennial myself, I can tell you it's right on the money, at least in my opinion. Um, and we'll provide resources for you to access that book as well. Terry has spent her career in the social impact space. She served as Vice President of Social Innovation at the Case Foundation and directed the President's Council on Service and Civic Participation, which is a presidential council to expand volunteering and service across the country and around the world. She's also currently the board chair of Mobilize.org and serves on the board of Repair the World and is an advisor to the new social startup Fuse Corps. We are extremely lucky and excited to have Carrie and Derek with us today. And I think that's about it. So I'm going to hand things over and we're going to get started. So Carrie, I'm going to hand it over to you Perfect. right now. Yes. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, let's see here. We can, yes. Okay, fantastic. I will go to presentation mode. Oops, how can we, uh, can I minimize this? Sorry, I'm not acting very millennial right now. I'll just put it over here. Unless, can I close out without losing everybody? <laughs> you know? Well, uh, I'll put it over there. Okay. That's fine. Um, so first of all, Sherry, thank you so much. Um, Derek and I are really thrilled to join you um, and join the Volunteer Match community today to share some of our thoughts and our reflections on, um, on the millennial generation. I think both of us have been very deeply engaged in the millennial uh, 
millennial space for a number of years now, and we've been around tables and boardrooms across the country. We've had the privilege to speak with you know, numerous executive leaders, um, and of course, millennials themselves. And after these conversations, um, Derek and I often joke and say, why is it that the nonprofit sector just loves to hate millennials? Now, we have some ideas as to why this is the case. Um, at the top of that list is the fact that we make you work really hard. We make you work hard for our limited dollars, our limited time, our limited attention spans, but we don't necessarily think that it needs to be that way. The truth is that organizations that we found that have the highest rates of involvement and real, uh, you know, authentic engagement with this generation are the ones that really make a conscious effort to set aside a bit um, and to relinquish the control. Those who recognize that it's really not just about you or your institution. Um, now, in the most recent Millennial Impact Report that Derek is going to speak much more about uh, when, when he jumps into the conversation, Achieve looked very specifically at what makes Millennial Act. Um, you know, the question, is it the design of the, uh, you know, is, is it the design of a message? Um, is it uh, you know, the delivery? Is it the message itself? And the highest reaction from Millennials comes when the institution clearly articulates their mission and then moves to the side. When they say, you know, if you care about, uh, you know, childhood obesity, if you care about the environment, if you care about fighting malaria, uh, here's how you can help. Here are the actionable steps that you can take to get engaged. Whether this is in volunteerism, whether it's activism, whether it's giving, uh, the question that we think organizations need to be asking is, how do millennials use my organization as a conduit for the issue that they care about? Now, there are a few themes that Derek and I write about in Cause for Change, and, and we believe um, that we can help, you know, that, that some of these themes really help start shifting or the organizational mindset, um, organizational culture a bit. And I think for us, when we look at engagement, what we're really looking at is how do millennial values drive institutional change. So I want to jump into um, a few of these key themes um, to start off the conversation today. And the first is far to micro actions. Millennials participate at micro level before moving to highly involved states cause action. Now, you don't have to think back probably too far. I would imagine that a number of your organizations have experimented perhaps in the last five years or so with creating young professional groups. And you may have gotten mixed results. Um, you know, young professional groups are most likely for a very small sliver of the 80 million millennials who are out there. Um, these are, you know, these programs can be really high touch, deep engagement, you know, leadership development. But the truth is the vast majority of millennials want to participate in micro ways. Sometimes this is dismissed as a form of slacktivism, right? We prefer to actually think about this, sort of activism, right? Organizing activism. And the question becomes, how do we uh, move millennials up this ladder of engagement? Now, we think it's important not to discount these smaller acts. If you really want millennials to participate in your programs, uh, to attend your events, you need to create small, actionable steps that lead to greater activity. Um, you know, if you can get them to like something on Facebook, then challenge them to, you know, challenge yourselves to see if they'll post something, text something to their friends, even email or call. These are each uh, micro actions, but they're le leading to deeper engagement. So I want to take a look at something more recently uh, that um, is, a, is an incredible example of micro actions. Um, we saw this as 3 million people changed their profile pictures the week that the oral arguments were taking place in the Supreme Court of Doma, the Defense of Marriage Act. Now, the question on everyone who was paying attention to what was happening on Facebook and, and Twitter was, will the 2.7 or 3 million people who changed their profile photos actually make a difference? And if so, in what way? 
Now, for a long time, when people stood up for a cause and weren't all physically you know, standing shoulder to shoulder, uh, a la Hands Across America or some other examples of that, the size of their impact wasn't immediately apparent. But today, we can see the spread of an idea online in greater detail than ever before. Now, while 3 million 20 and 30-somethings on Facebook who are all updating their profile pictures at once may not actually sway the Supreme Court one way or another, it does make uninformed audiences aware that a discussion is being had. It's also, it, it makes them aware of what's at stake and of what can be done to support it. And so, um, you know, so, so we think it's important to, to think about this. Now, what we see happening quite often is that organizations focus on the outliers, those super millennials that, that we read about in the papers who are uh, you know, building social movements through Facebook or toppling governments through the use of Twitter. When that happens, it's profound. Not every member of the 80 million millennials who are out there is a true leader. In fact, most of them fall somewhere in the middle of the road. So how do we move them up this ladder of engagement? And we like to say that rather than going complete engagement from the beginning, we need to get millennials to take these incremental steps. And organizations need to change their mindset that they always need to react um, you know, to, you know, to, to millennials uh, or show that you have immediate uh, opportunities for them to sign up and take action. Instead, you need to figure out ways to connect with them on their terms and in a format that really feels uh, right for them to act in that time. Uh, so that's a little bit about micro actions. The second theme I want to talk about is peer influence and the influence of, of small groups. Uh, what we know is that Millennials participate with and family and colleagues, um, whether this is uh, you know, in terms of volunteering, um, but also in terms of their giving habits as, as well. And, and Derek will speak to some, he talks through some of the new research. Um, but I, what's really fascinating is to think about how many people are truly in our social networks. When you think about it right now, how many people are you truly close with? How many do you call? Do you text? Uh, you know, do you email on a daily or maybe a weekly basis? If that number, if you really drill down, it may surprise you just how small it is. So the screenshot that I have right now um, up on the screen is actually taken from a book uh, by Paul Adam. Paul Adams uh, worked at Facebook. Works at Facebook. Um, he wrote the book Groups, and it's based on research and analytics from Facebook. And it basically shows that even if you have 500 or 1,000 friends, people are really only close with it most around people. So a handful of people. Um, and you know, that's kind of alarming to think about when you, when you really drill down, but, but that's kind of true if you think about your, um, you know, your habits in, in terms of how you're communicating with, with a group of friends. Um, it's usually a very small group. So here's where organizations get a little bit sidetracked, however. Now, they get really, really excited about bringing in individuals with very large followings and think to themselves, okay, here's what we're going to do. We've got this person, we've got a thousand followers, we're going to tell them, you know, what to say, how to say it, and then a thousand people are going to show up at our volunteer service project next week. Everybody is going to be on the banks of the river cleaning up, and the talking thing is that it doesn't happen. And it's not going to happen because really they're only close with a small group of people. Um, so how do we get them to uh, really engage with, with their peers I and mean, get more individuals to engage their peers? And we know that millennials uh, are their peers in nearly every facet of their life. And this is everything from purchasing decisions to how they engage with organizations and nonprofits. And there are small pathways that individuals can take to get their peers to, to, to like the cause. And naturally, as they begin to activate, they, they start to do small group things together. Um, we saw in the real impact study the extreme influence that peers and family members, even coworkers, have on engaging others and attracting them to their cause. And, and that's actually where we start to focus on what we call the virtuous cycle of engagement. Um, so I've put that up on the screen for you. Um, 
And, and here's, you know, here's how, we, how we kind of lay this out. If we can take the mindset of the inquisitive or the, the conscious consumer and then translate this behavior into deeper engagement, then this becomes more than just a trend for good. It has the potential to drive a deeper kind of engagement and social change. Um, and this is you know, what we refer to as a virtuous cycle of engagement. So engagement level one there at the top of your screen is the millennial inquisitor. All right, at this level, millennials might be exposed to a, a, a message directly from an organization, uh, but most likely they're getting something from a friend or a peer. Regardless, it doesn't matter how they actually receive the message, the goal for the organization is to get individuals to learn more about the cause. And what needs to be done is you need to capitalize on the impulsive nature of millennials by making this easy. Spending time simplifying your message and creating clear and present calls to action. And if you're able to do this, then you enter into your, your space in some way or another are going to move on to the next level, which is content consumption. All right. At this level, millennials have moved beyond just kind of a, a general interest to really wanting to um, understand you know, who it is, what you, who you are, and what, what it is that you stand for. They're interested enough to poke around on your site. Now they, they want a few very key things. They want information. They want knowledge. They want expertise, whether they want to give their own expertise or, or receive expertise from you. But above all, millennials are trying to find an opportunity. Um, this could be really to volunteer, to attend an event, maybe to seek an active role as a leader. Uh, but, but truly, dynamic content on your website and your mobile device will determine whether or not they move to deeper levels of engagement. And this is a critical point where the biggest drop-off in the cycle occurs if millennials fail to see themselves uh, or fail to really see a way to involve themselves. Um, but for those who do see uh, a way and, and, and kind of a path, they move into the millennial activist stage. And at this stage, an individual has really gone through the discovery phase, they've engaged with an organization's content, they've found an active role that resonates with them and their personal goals for engagement, and now it's time for them to start taking action. And we typically see four major, major roles um, of activism. We see cause champions. Uh, content creators, volunteers, and financial supporters. Um, and finally, the smallest but most committed group uh, there on the left side of your screen, those parents, the influencers who care enough to really actively seek the involvement of their peers. They tell their friends, their family about an organization, and they tend to be very persuasive uh, in these efforts. They focus on how each individual within their close networks can really get involved and be an active agent in the organization. Uh, this is anything from asking peers for money to getting volunteers, petition signers, that is genuine and it's intentional. And intentional. Um, now, at each level of engagement, as you increase in intensity, the number of millennials within that level gets smaller. Um, but it's important for organizations to really understand what messages and what tools help facilitate movement between each level. Um, the, the, third, uh, the third trend we want to talk about is um, this idea of tangible transparency. Act equals transparent solutions. Now, when you think about it, how many of you can say what a dollar does, what five dollars does, ten dollars? Some organizations, uh, you know, for example, like Malaria No More can say ten dollars provide a bed net saves a life. Uh, we've seen this a lot in the international space, whether it's malaria, access to clean water, but millennials want to understand the impact of their time and the impact of dollars. And organizations need to provide tangible information for millennials to really their cause affects the community. Um, you know, how do you make money? How do you spend money? How do you involve people at all levels of the organizations? Millennials are impulsive, and I'm sure that both Sarah and I will, will, you know, say that word over and over today, but millennials are impulsive, and they act on those impulses if they can articulate the impact and share that with their friends and their family. Now, um, you also have to realize that millennials received much of their training uh, in, 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 in cause engagement through event-based mo models. 
Um, and this happened while they were growing up, whether it was bisons, uh, bolathons, walkathons. Event-based models have been central to how millennials have raised money and awareness for causes that they care about since they were, in, you know, since they were school age. Um, and so that's part of the reason that models like Dance Marathon, which on uh, the campus of Penn State uh, raised more than $12 million this year, and made it the largest student-run philanthropic event. Uh, so where does tangible transparency fit in here? If you take a look, we've made it incredibly easy to understand the value of every dollar, whether it's $25 that provides an hour of music therapy or $1,500 for a special nurse coordinator being very deliberate about explaining how, how money is raised and how it will be spent. Um, so those are, those are a few of the things that I wanted to walk through before um, Derek dives a little bit more deeply into some of the research and, um, and also some of the usability testing that they've been doing um, at Achieve. So Derek, I am going to change presenter and see if we can do this explicitly. Thanks, Gary. And uh, as Gary's doing that, I'll give you a little bit of background as to what we've been doing over the course of the last four years. When we started, uh, when we started this process of trying to understand millennial engagement, one of the things that we set out to do is to find out that trigger point, the reason why a millennial in that moment would act, would act for good, and that's a response to somebody, or even if it's for themselves to then act for the first time. And what we continue to come back to. Derek, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, oh, there we go. We couldn't see your screen. Now we can. Sorry. All right. So what millennials continue to, as we have seen over the last four years, is this sense around what's called usability. If any of you have gone through website redesigns, technology redesigns, those kinds of things, this word is often used by those that develop web content. And what we've discovered in usability is this sense that millennials are being influenced heavily within the consumer-based world, where, you know, whether it's buying something online, buying something through mobile, and even how they interact and share experiences about products with friends and family and so forth. Well, when they're seamlessly moving from whether it's buying a consumer product to donating, there is no, well, you know, this organization shouldn't have those kind of answers and so on. And what we've seen, especially as we started to do use a bit with millennials, where we recorded millennials in front of solicitations and websites and messages, is that time and time again, is this disconnect between look, looking at and reading content online or even person as to what they perceive should happen. And part of that is definitely influenced consumer side. Usability really considers um, five, five factors overall. When, when a millennial will go to a site, see if they're satisfied, there are no errors, that they remember something, and at the same time, the learning is an efficient process. And as you think about those things, we have to make all of those things work, whether we're asking for volunteers or whether we're asking for money. Can we succinctly help them understand why it is we need money. What can they learn in the request briefly and impulsively, but yet what can they do in an efficient manner that has no errors and they can remember the experience in which that they helped somebody. And so as we've started to look at millennials uh, overall over the last years in our research, we've discovered the key things that are occurring in what we call continuum of engagement here, which is how they connect, and that includes everything from mobile and social media, how they involve from micro-volunteering to larger volunteering, and then how they get from micro-giving all the way up to monthly. So in the first phase of rounding, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more about what the research we discovered this year, but I'll give you a brief review of some key things that I've discovered over the, over the years in the past. One is the use of mobile device. I mean, it is so substantial now. When we first started looking at millennials, roughly 50 to 60 percent were looking at nonprofit content uh, in, within their mobile devices, and today it's close to 80 percent, and 80 percent in its climb. And in fact, one of their first experiences with a nonprofit organization is more likely to happen in a mobile device than it is in any other medium. And that exposure comes from usually a couple places. The first one being from a, a friend or a peer who mentioned something in the social network. 
to from an email, whether it be from a forward or a share from one of their friends or family members, or if they even happen to see a marketing message in a cluttered space, uh, and they actually see it and then are intrigued and interested to go participate and find out more. Mobile by far is the channel of preference that we have seen used by most, the vast majority of millennials. Now, what we're also discovering though too is that even though things like text giving are not are are still are still awesome, they're not as big as say online giving in a web space, and some of that's coming from mobile giving as well. And what we've also wanted to find out this year in some of the pieces as well, so since we know things are happening on mobile devices, what are they actually doing? And a substantial amount of them are still reading actual email content. And I will say over the course of the last couple of years, this has gone down a little bit, but we still see that millennials are, by and large, reading email content as it's directed from a friend and or from the organization itself. What's also really interesting about this email content is that they're truly only reading content from up to about five organizations. They may have registers signed up or even heard from some other places, but in fact it's a really small group of, of key organizations that they follow. And this also translates into some of the social media network piece, whereas we started to watch millennials when they were going through social networks, and when they were on Facebook, and on Twitter. In fact, we watched a, a millennial do this. We, we put them in front of an organization and we said, all right, where are you going to go now? And the first thing that they did is they went to Facebook and liked the organization. But there was no decision-making process. It was just a habit. And when we later came back and started to ask some questions, well, how many times have you visited their Facebook page? How many times have you heard from them and discussed or talked with them? It was really minimal. And in fact, in one case, they couldn't even remember signing up for following them with the organization. And so as Carrie was mentioning earlier, is now it's, it, it is about getting some fans to follow, but what we're, deceive, what we're seeing now is that there's a core group of organizations, a really small group that millennials are truly conversing with, and now the goal is how do you become one of those preferred organizations versus just one they just like. Uh, because liking is the first form of, as you've seen it, but we've got to intensify that relationship over time. And so know that you are going to be in a crowd of many of the organizations, and as some ones have even uh, taken to liking anything at times when they're visiting content to share, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a part of you overall. And when we started to monitor millennials, we noticed another key thing too, is that one of the first actions millennials were taking is they went to websites after we told them to go to a website. Uh, and we had, by the way, a range of organizations from one.org all the way down to the American Pianist Associations and the small university that were all part of our testing. And each and every time, one of the first things that they were drawn to was to connect and sell a network to a social media outlet, to hear from them or to hear some of the things that are going on. What was really articulated in the, in the user testing with us is the fact that they, the reason going to these social networks and social media and are these access to people is because they felt and they verbalized it to us that that was the, that was the place to hear them up to date, the most relevant information. Because they felt even since the websites that they've gone to, some of the look ones, didn't have the most current things that the organization was working on. Remember that impulse piece that we were talking about earlier? And so as we see them interact with websites and where they go, they're looking for this current and relevant conversation that they're looking at. And in the same thing you're going to hear about us talk about later is this immediate feedback mechanism, which is social media does, right? So even though we're having a conversation and I can see what's happening in Twitter, I can gauge the conversation that what we're talking about, they're doing the same thing with your organization as well. What is happening now that I can either get involved with or react to? And then we also look at solicitation material and we look at volunteer requests. As Carrie mentioned, there this direct link into I care about the issue. Now, there's sort of this institution agnostic feeling out there with the generation. And part of that comes from this, this blending of all of our lives. So whether it's our personal life, whether it's our work life, our faith life, 
all of those things coming together and being one part of the one part of the individual. And we've seen that. And, you know, I, I'll have this conversations with corporations. We'll say, you know, when that millennial new employee scans their car to come into your building, they do not choose to keeping of that they have on the side out of that. It's a part of it, and so is your company. It's a part of them too, and they breathe that as they go even into their personal life. So it's not just that they're bringing it into the work, they're bringing work into the personal space. And each time that we think about how a millennial will react to certain things, whether it be about the institution or about the topic, by far we've seen so much better response when that millennial can say, if I give or if I serve in this 40 minutes, somebody's going to help. Somebody is going to be better than ever before. And in fact, when we, would, we, we put positioning in front of millennials and would say something like, you know, if you give $5 or if you give an hour, you will help somebody get water in Africa. Support this now versus support the organization to provide for, you know, drinking water people. And of course, each and every time as we reposition it, the issue by far is better connecting first. Support the organization in its marketing of really help the or help Neil understand how they do their work over time to understand the deeper relationships where things like young professional groups and other aspects come in. Okay, so one of the key things discovered last year is this new volunteer exist for millennials. As Carrie mentioned, we, we, we were sensed about eight years ago or so that the best way about millennials is to create these special groups for them, to not bring them all together, have them participate in social activities, education activities, all of other kinds of things together. And we're going to assume that because we create this group of like-minded people just like that, they're all going to have a great time. And some of them do. Them are not necessarily looking for that kind of commitment. And in fact, as we have uh, here at Achieve looked at organizations that have had young professional groups, some of them have decreased over time only because that they look at the type of person they're catering to, it's more on the upper age brackets of the millennial, uh, the millennial age span rather than necessarily the younger population who might just want to participate in episodic ways as an experiential opportunity in cause work rather than being, I'm completely committed to these kinds of things. As for that millennials, we see that organization, as you establish your service offerings, that we have to help a millennial enter in at any point of interest. And other than that, if they want to do an hour at home right now for you, they can. All the way to if I want to organize eight to ten people to come out on a Saturday to help your cause and organization, they can do that too as well. So for you as an organization, creating a continuum, creating an opportunity for them to not only make an impactful impression, with the beneficiaries at half hour to an hour, all the way leading up to others. And this feeling of that I have to be in person with you to serve is also a piece we can to hear from millennials that they're reacting differently to. What they're really looking for is how can I be anywhere, evangelize about you, share about you, help do things at home on my computer for you, all of those things that make me a part of your organization but I'm not there with you. And then we, especially at universities, another, the challenge of you know, bringing everybody to campus, this mentality that for a millennial of everybody and we can see them all, know that they're involved. But for the generation, they're actually not thinking that way. They're thinking that if I share something, if I involve my friends, if I'm active to get other people to sign a petition or getting five people to do our own volunteer project for you where you weren't involved, but you were the beneficiary of it, that I am a supporter of you. The thinking and the change in how we view their active involvement. And as I mentioned earlier, this preference for really short-term commitments is for the mass population. Uh, now, I know that there's only so much that can be done in these short-term commitments, but some of that, what we've heard, is that for, for bigger commitments, after they had an initial experience, the organization, they're finding these intrinsic benefits like meeting people and networking and personal experience. 
and especially the challenge with the economy and not having employment, they're really turning to the sector as an opportunity to gain meaningful experience that may have not been in college. And so for you, creating that continuum to say, well, we've got opportunities for you to use your skill, even for a half hour, whether it's you can help design something, maybe it's design 10 images that we can use in Facebook in the next hour and share our message better, all the way leading to you can come on site and use your skill for something in our marketing or fundraising arms or even our events would be great. We've also seen this high interest in when they're getting to the time of actually serving for you is this lower uh, or you know lower lead up time to actually getting on there and having that impact. We've heard time and again from some of the millennials we talked to over the course of last year uh, in this this year spent is that I'm looking for ways to serve immediately, but how can I learn about what I need to do in any environment? Why do I have to go to a training on site? Why can't it be done virtually? Get a call for 15 minutes and tell us what we should know. Give us a few short blitz on what we should see or read before we get there. Show us images of the things that we plan to do when we're on site, rather than just images of the people we see before we get there. And so this sense of how can I deliver and train and get them prepared so that when they're on making every minute of making the best of every minute that they can offer to your organization. So as we go into some final thoughts, and of course we're going to go into some questions here, I'm going to ask Carrie to describe really the platform that we have seen millennial engagement, and then I'll end it from there. So Carrie, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Derek. Uh, you know, I think I think everybody's kind of looking for the silver bullet. What is you know what is that way that that um, we can just make this all happen? Will our, the millennials show up and and get engaged? And, uh, you know, Derek and I never claim to uh, have the silver bullet, but we have created something that we like to call Build or the Millennial Engagement Platform. And throughout the book, through each chapter, we incorporate elements of Build um, into um, you know to to show. Uh, organizations really how they can be how, how they can be using this in a practical way within their institutions so um, so what is build build um, starts with uh, be unified be unified as an organization about working with this generation this starts by really getting every level of your organization interested in what this generation can provide um, now it, it's it's true that many quickly gravitate to the financial opportunities, but um, we think that's kind of the wrong framework to, to always lead with. Instead, um, you need to understand and agree that engaging millennials points um, for cultivating them. And most of those don't actually end with the immediate transfer of dollars, although that can be an ultimate goal. Um, the, the, the second part of BUILD is, is to understand environment and understanding the complexities of the generation's environment. Um, you know, beyond just understanding why you should work with millennials, uh, you really need to appreciate the environment that this generation is currently in, the environment in which uh, you know, we've grown up in. We all live in a society that's connected 24-7. Uh, but for the greater number of millennials, you know, they can hardly remember a time when that was not the case. So we, we're seeing incredible change, but it's really the, uh, you know, the accelerated speed of change in today's society that's having a huge impact on, on all of us. And um, you know, I also have to understand that millennials have a multitude of people and organizations and brands all competing for their limited attention. And so it's important to really take the time to understand and to appreciate the environment um, that they're in, and then create a role within the environment to engage them. Um, next, uh, the next level of build is, is to identify um, identifiers, identify change makers, those who are truly seeking to make a difference. Um, you know, for every uninterested millennial, there's probably a boomer or a Gen Xer who are also uninterested. Forget those people. You know, just just for, for put those over to the side, and instead, really find those who want to work with you, who want to make meaningful change with you. Um, create calls to action that are asking for millennials uh, to identify themselves and invite them into a process 
of creating solutions. Find ways that they can work with you um, and, and really find those millennials who are in the community who want to take their participation to the next level. Um, uh, the, the next part of build is, is leading by engagement. Um, you know, really leading through engagement rather than through participation. So focus on conversational and relationship engagement. If you're going for pure numbers at your event, you may have some short-term wins, but that really doesn't get at the heart of the problem. True engagement comes um, from attendees who are returning, who are telling their friends about your message. And as an organization, you can create new levels of engagement that truly focus on getting to know millennials, getting to know their interests, getting to know what excites them. Um, you know, true engagement means that you understand how they want to communicate, how they want to participate, um, and uh, how they actually want to challenge your organization to be better. And then finally, determine your own millennial success. This is going to be different for every organization, but before you begin, create some kind of a standard for what millennial success and engagement looks like, and then institutionalize it. Some organizations do really well with millennial engagement because they have a defined idea of what it means for their cause and, um, and what it means for millennials to be involved. They identify a starting point, a goal, and then the steps that will take out there. Um, so, uh, you know, what we encourage you to do is help the organizations that you're a part of to really understand what those benchmarks are and then rally around them for both short and long-term uh, success. So that's, um, that's the build platform. That's really what we, um, you know, we have identified as, as um, you know, some of the core steps in building the engagement and uh, as we finish here, we, I would say that uh, uh, there are some others that I would mention. The, the first one being is being present without being present, if you haven't heard that before. And uh, as you've seen some of our, our materials here and, and also some of the research, it's something that I can help you without actually being a person with you. And it doesn't necessarily mean interest. And this happens more in the education space or someone uh, volunteered for the first time, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely interested yet. There is this philanthropic and pause uh, experimentation going on with millennials in the beginning. And that's the opportunity for them to really understand where their, where their interests lie. And so that leads into some challenges with retention, of course. And then feedback is better than ever. You know, why wait a year to do the annual report? Here's your opportunity to offer things in social media where you can share success much faster and quicker since you know models are there. And then generations are actually becoming more unified in their preferences and communication, much more than it's just about models. I mean, the things that I shared today, we're seeing across all generations. And that comes true with technology, that comes true with different aspects of how just communication in general has changed. It doesn't necessarily have to be all millennial specific, but how are you communicating with a new digital audience that's out there than ever before? So Sherry, I think uh, as we end here with how culture and is changing, I mentioned that uh, in, in our culture we're getting faster and more transparent, and so as an organization, knowing that you can tell more of your story and be as transparent as possible is probably going to get that in from all. As we enter, I know we have some questions, Sherry, that hopefully we'll get to answer. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, okay, let me we take back control of the slides. <laughs> All right, so um, before we launch to the questions, we do have a bunch of really great ones. Why don't you two quickly talk a little bit about your book? Carrie, you want to take that one? Sure, I will. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you, Sherry. And I think if uh, your endorsement in the beginning of the call by saying you are a millennial and uh, you know the fact that the book resonated with you, 
um, you know, that is always, it's music to your ears, um, because actually the book is not written for millennials themselves. We love that it resonates and that, that you thought that, uh, you know, some of the information and suggestions were spot on, because um, we hope that that's the case. But really, we've written it for, um, for executive leader directors, for, um, you know, for those in leadership positions who are really grappling with uh, how to engage this next generation. And, um, and so, you know, we're, we're really excited about um, the conversation that the book has prompted um, across, uh, you know, organizations that are very large national institutions to uh, very small local organizations who are learning um, different methods for, for engaging this generation. And so I'm thrilled to be able to prompt this dialogue. We're also finding that what it's, um, what it's driving is some additional cross-generational dialogue, um, and that we think is incredibly important. So while we, you know, while we, we focus a great deal on the millennial generation themselves, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is much more about how millennial values are driving organizational change and institutional change. And, um, and for us, that is kind of the important larger mess here um, and, and really what we hope uh, gets, gets through. So, um, you know, this opportunity to give you, a little, you know, the, the highlights from the book, um, but um, for those who want a deeper dive, uh, we hope you'll, you'll check it out on Amazon or uh, Nook or, or your local bookstore if you still have this. So. <laughs> Great, thanks. And um, there have been a few requests. Can you provide your definition for us of millennial? What what age group does that uh, encompass? So we, uh, Carrie, I can. We it it kind of depends sometimes. There are some that believe that it goes to the uh, it's between the ages of twenty and thirty five, and some others that look at it that it stops at thirty. Uh, and the reason why there's some discrepancy between um, whether it stops at it's 20 to 30 or 20 to 35 is because sometimes those that are aged between 30 and 35, they have, we call them cuspers because they're on the cusp of Gen X and Gen Y, uh, another, another name for millennials, Gen Y. And because of that, the more opportunities that we can bring or present or provide for um, you know for, for generations to solve problems together um, you know the, the, the greater um, they're, they're going to uh, you know the, 
that it's going to be really good for everyone. I think that um, we're finding that the tension points um, are actually uh, much higher between Gen Y and Gen X because you know Gen X sometimes is, is kind of this smaller, you know, almost forgotten generation, and they're still driving incredible change and they're doing remarkable things. Um, but because they're sandwiched between the baby boomers who are uh, very large um, and the you know and, and then baby boomers. Uh, kids, the, the millennials, who are also a, a very, very large um, and, and diverse and vocal generation, um, you know, that finding those opportunities for more of the cross-generational engagement is very important. And so, um, and really to, you know, s taking on challenges together is, is a way to, that we found is, is uh, effectively doing that. And I would say from a practitioner standpoint, there, there are opportunities, especially when it comes down to marketing campaigns or fundraising campaigns, that we have seen nonprofit organizations say, you know, one of our key things right now is to send out this message about childhood obesity. And they use all generations in the same conversation to say, well, how do we segment this to make sure that we hit different demographics, both of age and gender and all of those things? And, and also those that are much more in our followings, whether they're in social media and so forth. And so some of the best discussions have occurred when all generations are involved, especially in external marketing message groups, where they can come together and actually create alternative versions for different demographics. And what we have also discovered is that whether it's a, a boomer working with a millennial, that millennial is having an opportunity to help that boomer understand how to connect with the Gen Y. And then that boomer is sometimes even taking some of that language and using it directly in how they're connecting with other boomers and others that are very connected that are of that demographic as well. So I would say if you're looking at external communication, that's a great chance to have marketing groups come together that are intergenerational. Wonderful, thanks. So on to the next question. Um, you know, a really hot topic lately has been the connection, at least in, in my world, <laughs> has been the connection between volunteering and uh, employability and the ability to find a job. Um, and obviously this is a really important issue for millennials who are notoriously underemployed. So. Um, can you talk about the role of potential job training or skill acquisition in millennial engagement for nonprofits? So, uh, Carrie, I can start out and feel free to chime in here. Um, we, you know, the, the, the stats are challenging right now. So 50% of those that graduate from college are unemployed. Those that are employed, 60% of millennials are underemployed, meaning that they're in jobs that they never anticipated that they would be in. Um, and, and so what they're doing is, is that they're looking to the sector, as we mentioned, to find the skills that would help them advance because some of them do not have experiences enough to make them maybe employable by you know, other entities and corporations and others. And so this is where uh, nonprofits are there's sort of two challenges that come with this, right? So if millennials are looking for uh, volunteer opportunities that are highly skill-based, and then they go to a nonprofit and they see almost all the opportunities are basically a type of manual labor or something else, which is needed, um, they tend, they might shy away from that. Uh, in fact, when we were looking at a small segment of a population that, that in our research this year, we noticed a lot of the comments were, or negativity was around, well, the reason I didn't volunteer for that organization or this set of organizations is because all of the opportunities sound very similar. It didn't offer anything that I felt I could learn from or gravitate and, and, and enhance my own skills. And therefore, I either decided not to go back or I decided not to even you know, start volunteering with them from the beginning. We do find that it would be best if organizations could create those opportunities because millennials are very creative, very solutions-inspired oriented types of, of individuals. Uh, but the challenge on the nonprofit side is the ability for them to accept a millennial who has that interest and get them into a meaningful volunteer skill-based opportunity because not all of us have those. And even developing that can be a little bit of a challenge as well. Uh, but in, in, in the same light, we do then see some millennials venturing off on their own and then creating their own entities and, and so on, which is also another challenge uh, in discussion. 
But what we have found is that at least if, if the organization can create meaningful skill place pieces in marketing, um, technology, and events, we do see that the millennial finds that as a very valuable experience, which can then add value to them going back into another sector as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, we, we have time for one or two more questions, I think. So um, another question, um, I think a, a lot of nonprofits that try and engage millennials find that um, attendance rates can be a little low. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that millennials really value learning something while volunteering or while being engaged. Um, and one, what, one person commented that um, their organization offers very relevant training for volunteers, but um, it's tough to get the younger generation to, to show up and to, to join these conversations. What are some ways that nonprofits can, can get them more active in that way? I think the first um, and probably the most important is, um, you know, this this idea of group, uh, you know, doing things in group and, and the peer influence. And if you can find one or two or three or a handful of, um, you know, real uh, millennial influencers who have, um, you know, have, have networks of, of people that they are engaged with um, and who can bring them in um, and get other people excited, that's when we're seeing a, a deeper investment. People want to do things together. They want to do things in groups. Um, and, um, and so if you can create those authentic experiences for them to, to do things together, um, we're, we're seeing uh, higher retention rates, um, you know, when, when that happens. Um, Derek, I don't know if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree and concur. And, I, you know, I think that uh, we, we have to look at deciding here, too, is how can we identify millennials that are self-organizing? So there are a lot of millennials out there that self-organize opportunities and work for cause issues. Now our goal is also to look in our community and say who's organizing around issues and topics that relate to our mission and bringing them in, whether that is through monitoring in social media conversations from individuals from your local community to events and activities that relate to what you're doing. Those are all things that we should consider scanning, looking for, and trying to connect with them. Because millennials are actively engaged in issues and causes. They might even be engaged in what you're doing already with a small peer group. Now you've got to bring them in. Great, thanks. Yeah, you know, that goes back to the whole idea of, um, you know, your organization being the conduit for their engagement, you know, and that it's, it's more of a long-tail process. You know, it's, it's, I found that it, it really requires a shift in thinking. Um, that it's not just a one-touch or a two-touch process, that, that really you're, you're creating long-term strategies for building relationships with millennials. So it's, it's, um, it's a challenge for a lot of us, but I think in, a huge payoff in the end. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. I think we have time. Oh, you know what? I think I'm, I'm going to respect everyone's time. And so um, I'm, I'm not going to take any more questions. I apologize to everyone whose questions were not answered. We're, we still have them, and we hopefully will be able to follow up with you directly after the session. Um, so we're just about out of time. Huge thank you to Carrie and Derek. Before we end, I want to um, quickly um, make a plug for next month's Nonprofit Insights webinar. Um, we don't have the exact uh, title yet. Um, it will be on September 25th, and it's going to be about corporate nonprofit partnerships from three perspectives: that of the small nonprofit, that of the big huge nonprofit, and that of the corporation itself. So um, that's going to be a really fun, lively session. I mean, you can um, learn more about that uh, soon at learn.volunteermatch.org. So again, a huge thank you to Carrie and Derek for joining us, sharing your expertise, answering our questions. Um, I learned so much, um, and it really, I feel energized to implement some strategies to better engage millennials. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you, all of you attendees, for joining us in this conversation. And we hope to see you again next month on a Nonprofit Insights webinar. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks so much, Jerry.